Originally from uh, Detroit. I went to high school at uh, Don Darrow High School in Royal Oak. My parents moved my brother and I out to uh, the suburbs when I turned five. I was offered a job uh, to work for the BBC News in Washington, D.C., so I moved out to D.C. and during, during that period working for them, I started volunteering with a bunch of uh, Syrian nonprofits, which took me to uh, Jordan and Lebanon to photograph in the camps uh, there, and then that also took me to photograph the devastation that was going on in Syria. And when I came back, um, I ended up getting the job offer from the New York Times, and they said, you know, you have to move to New York for the job. And so my contract was just about ending with BBC News and I relocated back to New York City and started working for the New York Times. And during this period, uh, again, I would go back and forth to DC and volunteer uh, for a bunch of like Syrian organizations. And uh, the lady who hired me to go to Syria, um, they didn't have any other work coming up in the foreseeable future because of budget uh, constraints. And she mentioned, you know, there was this new crisis happening in the, in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea between Libya and uh, Italy. The book is called Despite It All We Never Learn. Uh, it's a culmination of four and a half years of testimonials uh, and a couple essays that I wrote um, about my time in the Mediterranean uh, rescuing refugees. And essentially, uh, it's um, every, every person that I spoke to, um, they talk about, you know, like why they fled their homeland to, you know, their onward journey through the Sahara and then this sort of, um, sort of limbo uh, that is Libya, um, that, that has become the main gateway for, for migrants and refugees to try and get to Europe. Uh, so it's been a five and a half year um, sort of route uh, the Mediterranean has, and there's been over around 15,000 people that have died. So this book is, a homage to uh, the people who didn't make it, but also to the people that trusted me with their words. I think having people read that and putting it into the right hands, that will definitely change people's perceptions, I think, of refugees completely, and the crisis as well. And I think it's gonna draw a lot more light to it, and, and hopefully, you know, people have a different idea on why people are fleeing their homeland, you know, um, their onward journeys, you know, like what's that like for them, and then obviously their future. Because I think we have a sort of a skewed idea of like what an asylum seeker is, what a refugee is, what a migrant is. I feel like a lot of, especially Americans, they lump it all into one. So I took over 170 first-hand accounts from them. And a lot of this details, you know, their, their home life. Uh, you know, like where they grew up in Africa, where they grew up in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, why they fled from, you know, these areas uh, and their sort of onward journey from, you know, Nigeria to Niger to Mali to Algeria and then to the gateway that, that is Libya to Europe. And, you know, they would detail just every little thing about, you know, like a tinted out, you know, BMW pulling up to them and, you know, them, uh, the driver coming out with a gun and, you know, putting it to someone's head and telling them to get into the car, we're gonna take you to Libya. There's no job, by the way. We're just gonna sell you. And, you know, so hearing that, I was like, I gotta do something with these stories. Because, um, like I mentioned previously, a lot of the outlets didn't care for those stories. They just wanted those graphic photographs. And, and for me, those stories, is what's going to change the landscape and I think what, what people really need to hear. What's the bearing to the next target? Guys, uh, Nico, apparently the sponsor of the boat Clement is with is in bad condition. We were doing a rescue and there were maybe 30 or 40 um, people that fell into the water because their uh, like, um, the tube on the raft collapsed. Inside the stern. Okay, life jackets, cut this now. Cut this now, pass me life jackets. Let's go. You want to be one of them? I mean, to those guys, I'm going to chuck them life jackets. Second line! Cut the line, let's go. Where? Just this one. Hold on! Obviously, 
um, you know, the you know, nonprofit, you know, would want photographs, you know, that kind of show that desperation. But I mean, we're a team of four and there's 40 odd people in the water that are screaming because, you know, they can't swim for one. It's dark out. Some of them have life jackets. Um, so I would just sling the camera and I would go to, you know, any any part of our little rib and try and help bring people into the, um, bring people out of the water into our ship. Um, that to me just was uh, like first nature to me. Um, I didn't think of like taking the photographs just because like, you know, this is a human being. Why would I want someone to take a picture of me if I was, you know, sort of screaming or drowning in, in this vast sea? So I slung the camera and would immediately go into action and, you know, help these people. And, you know, a lot of the times, you know, they would ask me if I got photographs like that. And I'd be like, no, I didn't get anything like that. Like, it's, you know, it's completely dark out there. I don't have a flash on my camera. And, you know, like I just didn't feel it was the time to take something like that, you know? Like I heard people screaming, like I'm, that's, that's not why I'm over here is to document people dying. I'm here to, you know, rescue them. Like I, I you know, like I want them to make, make it to Europe. Like I want every single one of them to get to Europe. I want them to be safe.